أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد صلى على محمد وآل ثم الصلاة والسلام على آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المظلومين واللعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين اتقوا إذا مسهم طائف من الشيطان تذكروا فإذا هم مبصرون صلاة على محمد We continue with our discussion on the root cause of negative suffering and tonight inshallah we make a conclusion. Last night we stopped by saying that when one wishes to become aware of one's true identity, then there isn't anything to fight or suppress or remove, but rather one introduces awareness. Just like you don't fight darkness, you introduce light and it dissolves the darkness or you don't suppress and remove ignorance, you introduce knowledge and the ignorance dissolves. In the same way, we introduce awareness and that dissolves the heedlessness or the ghafla of being driven by the mind and believing every thought that comes into it. And we have been talking over these last several nights on how we bring about this awareness. We have talked about watching the mind, not identifying with the thinker, um, and we have also talked about being present at all times. We have also explained why and how, because shaitan helped in creating this egoic structure and keeping it alive, uh, the mind needs to constantly live in the past or the future to keep these thoughts coming through. And so shaitan can only influence us when we allow ourselves to live in the past or the future. When we live in the absolute present, then shaitan does not have anything that he can work with. He cannot generate thought that will give back unhappiness and suffering, which the mind thinks is solving a problem, but it is actually feeding uh, um, shaitan. And then we said, after this awareness, after this presence, the next step then is the dhikr of Allah. And we shall talk about that tonight. But before we do that, let us talk a little bit about a few things that we haven't had a chance to uh, do so until now. The first thing is, let us talk about finding out who we think we really are. The first and the most fundamental question that a human being needs to ask uh, his or herself is, who am I? And Islam gives this a lot of importance. That is why time and time again you will hear people quoting this hadith from the member, Man arafa nafsa, faqad arafa rabba. Whosoever knows his self, he knows his Lord. In other words, to know Allah, you must first know yourself. And if we go by what we have said so far, if we describe the ego as nafs, then it fits perfectly. Man arafa nafsa, whosoever recognizes his ego, whosoever realizes what the ego is, then that is the avenue through which he will know Allah. Because when that ego dissolves, when that nafs, that false structure disappears, then what remains in a surrendered state is Allah. Not that the person, na'udhu billah, becomes uh, uh, any form of divinity, but that Allah is then able to work through that person. So we shall see a bit more of that. Most people tend to be unconscious, and if you ask people who they are, they will give you their name, their address, their family history, their shape and size, and where they work, and how tall they are, and so on and so forth. Because they are unconscious and totally identified with the thoughts and the memories that they have collected that they believe to be themselves. Sometimes you will meet people who have taken some interest in religion and spirituality and they will give you a very spiritual definition. They will tell you, oh, I am a Shia of Ali bin Abi Talib or I am a, a, a spiritual being. I am an immortal being. I am not the physical body, you see. I am the soul behind the body. And they will give you such high sounding uh, phrases. I am this and I am that. The issue is, do they really know who they are or is it just some nice, high-sounding spiritual concepts that they have attached to their mind? And that's what we want to find out. 
Because knowing who you are has nothing to do with some mental label or some nice fancy spiritual concept that is floating in the mind. Knowing who you are is all about being aware and being present and not identifying with the mind. Rather than using the mind to create some high sounding spiritual idea that you attach to yourself. So what we want to see is not who you are, because we may not be at that stage of really knowing who we are, but who you think you are. Okay, so keep this in mind. I'm not talking about who you are. Who you are is of course Allah's representative when you're in a surrendered state. But who do we think? Uh, how do we, what is our sense of who we are? The way to find out who you think you are or who your mind thinks you are is to ask yourself, what is it that matters to you the most in life? And what is it that you perceive as your need in life? In other words, if we were conducting this in a class, I would have given you a piece of paper and said, write for me what you perceive as your needs in life, the things that you need to have. And then write for me the things that matter the most to you in life. Whatever matters to you is what will have the power and ability to upset you and disturb you. Anything that doesn't matter to you will not be able to influence you in that. And you can use this as a criteria, uh, as a criterion to know yourself very, very deeply. In other words, if what matters to you the most is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is only things related to Allah that will have the ability to disturb you. And if things related to Allah and His Messenger do not have any effect on you, they do not bother you when you read that in the news, then it means it is not important to you. It doesn't really matter to you. Okay. So what matters to you is not necessarily what you say or what you believe, but your action and your reaction to things that happen in your life, when challenges come, across, uh, come to you in life, how you react to them will tell us what really matters to you in life? So I need to ask myself, what are the things that have the ability to upset me and disturb me? If small things have the ability to disturb me and upset me, then that is who I think I am. I'm not saying that is who I am. But that is who subconsciously my mind thinks I am. Small. If trivial things have the power to upset you, then that is who you think you are, trivial, small, insignificant. Because otherwise you would not allow that to uh, bother you. So what are the things that are small and trivial? Ultimately, everything is small and trivial. Unless it is Allah and His Messenger, and the two weighty things He left behind, which is the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt Everything else is trivial because it is transient and temporary and fleeting. So on the grand scheme of things, nothing really matters. If it matters to you, then you see yourself as being transient and fleeting and insignificant. You might say, I am an immortal spirit. I am the ruh. I am not the jism. I am a Shia of Ali bin Abi Talib. I am this and I am that. I do not want anything in life. I just want peace and happiness. I want to devote myself to the Ahlul Bayt. I just want to do Ibadah of Allah. Very nice. And then the phone rings. Bad news. The contract has fallen through. Bad news. Your car has been stolen. Okay. And things like that. Or bad news. Your trip has been cancelled. Or your spouse has left you. Or Bad news, you have to pay more money. You got an email, they're saying it's your fault, whatever, whatever. Up until now, you were this immortal spirit who only wanted peace and happiness. Bad news, the stock market has collapsed, the deal has fallen through. Maybe if you're a woman, bad news, your mother-in-law is coming. <laughs> or even worse, she has arrived. Now, Suddenly, there is a change, there is anxiety, there is stress, there is frustration. 
and a harshness comes to the voice. I cannot take this anymore. I've had enough. This is not good. You have to do something about it. And we find ourselves accusing, blaming, attacking, defending, and even trying to justify our actions. And all this is happening on autopilot because the person is unconscious. So now something is obviously more important to you than that peace that you said is all you wanted a moment ago. A moment ago you said all I wanted was peace. I am an immortal spirit. But now you don't seem to be that immortal spirit. Now there is something else that is more trivial and small, but it has the power to disturb that peace. Because if the peace was more important to you, you would not have let go of it. The fact that you so easily replace it shows that that is not the most important thing to you in life. Now the deal or the money or the contract or the loss or the threat of that loss, that is now more important to you than that peace and that being that immortal spirit. To whom is this important? Is it important to that immortal spirit in you? No. It is important to that little me. To the one that wants happiness from external things and then when it can't get it, it gets frustrated. So at least now we know who we are. Up until now we thought I was this and I was that and I am a Shia of the Mahdi and I am this. And so if peace is what we really want, then peace is what we will choose every time. Every time a challenge comes, it comes to us in life, we will choose peace. And every time there is a challenge, whether it is a person or a situation, instead of reacting, we will stay present, we will stay alert. We will say the most important to, thing to me is my tranquility, my peace, the fact that I do not have any negative suffering. So whatever I do, I will not lose that. And then we will respond, but that respond will come with awareness. It will be a high quality response. Even when we say no, it will be a high quality no. And so when a person learns to stay present and with awareness and with consciousness of Allah at all times, then everything the person does has depth to it. He might just walk across from one side of the room to the other, but there will be quality in that walking. He might open a book, but there will be quality in that opening. He might look at you, but there will be depth in that vision. That is why you will see that the Imam ﷺ, when they would say things, sometimes they would say a very short phrase, which if you and I said, nobody would listen. But it stays like something that is immortal throughout the passage of time across history, because it has been said in a state of surrender. It might be something very, which me, you know, Somebody asks Imam Hussain salam for bay'ah, for example, of Yazid. He just responds. He says, Mithli la yubay'a mithlu Yazid. One who is like me does not pledge allegiance to one who is like Yazid. A short phrase. But we write it, we remember it, we quote it. Why? Because it wasn't said for the ego. It wasn't said, I don't give bay'ah to Yazid. No. There was depth to it. It was said in a state of surrender. So now it transcends time because it comes from a higher source. It comes from Allah. And so it stays across that uh, time. So the world will always make sure that you know who you are. And that is the beauty of this world. We curse it. We blame it. We say this and that about the world. We can fool ourselves. I can fool you and tell you I am this and that. You can fool me and tell me you are this and that. The world will not let you fool yourself. Sooner or later, it will throw a challenge at you so that you can see for yourself who you think you are. Always ask yourself, what are the things that upset me? And that thing is what you are worth in your own eyes. Not only will the world throw these challenges at you, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows people to suffer so that they can realize their true identity as well. For example, Surah At-Tawbah, which is chapter 9, verse 126, Allah says, أَوَلَا يَرَوْنَا أَنَّهُمْ يُفْتَنُونَ فِي كُلِّ عَامٍ مَرَّةً أَوْ مَرَّتَيْنِ 
do they not see that they are tried and tested once or twice every year? Allah is saying. Do they not see that we try them and test them once or twice every year? Apart from the small challenges you see every other day, but one or two major calamities befall you every year. ثُمَّ لَا يَتُوبُونَ وَلَا هُمْ And then they do not turn back to us, nor are they reminded. Nor do they come back and do our dhikr. Tawbah is to turn, to do a U-turn and come back to Allah. In other words, Allah is trying to bring your attention and call you back towards Him sometimes through this suffering. But instead of doing that, instead of suffering consciously, the ego comes in and says, it is wrong, I should not be suffering. Why am I suffering? And so we remain even more deeply unconscious because that challenge or that bala which was meant to be an opportunity to grow, we see it as an obstacle. And we say, why did Allah allow this to happen to me? And that exactly is where we lose out on a great opportunity. So there are situations that you will face in life for which you will not have answers. And life will seem totally meaningless. And nobody will have an answer for you. You can go to any alim or any sheikh and ask him, why is this happening to me? And they will not have an answer for you. At that point in time, instead of resisting and saying, why is this happening to me? Which the mind will say, I should not be suffering. If it is not through your own fault, in other words, if it is not something that has fallen us out of our own foolishness, or if it is not what is considered adab as opposed to bala, in other words, a punishment as opposed to a trial, and there is a lengthy discussion as to how to distinguish the two, but if we have done the best we can and then we are tried, then instead of resisting that, we need to learn how to yield and give in to that. We need to learn how to suffer consciously and not see that as something bad. And we have so many ahadith with this regard. In one hadith, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. When he was asked, does a believer suffer? He said, is suffering meant for anyone except a believer? Is bala for anyone except a mu'min? Allah feeds a mu'min with bala the way a family gives gifts to his family time and time again. He nourishes them. The words that have been used is that he nurtures them. And that is why Imam Musa al-Qadim as well on this, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He says, a mu'min is like a balance or a scale in which one side is his iman and the other side is his trials and tribulations. The more his iman increases, the more his bala will increase. The more Allah loves a person, the more he will try him because he finds him worthy of being tried. He finds him worthy of being promoted to a higher level. And so the more we resist suffering, the longer it will take us to dissolve uh, the ego. And when we learn to surrender and embrace this suffering, it will accelerate our spiritual growth because now we suffer consciously. And that is the meaning of ردم بِقَضَائِهِ وَتَسْلِيمًا لِأَمْرِهِ I am pleased with whatever you have decreed for me and I surrender to your orders and your command. That state of surrender. We should be the first people to promote the idea of surrendering to God because that's what Islam is, isn't it? Islam means to surrender. So we should be actually the leaders in, in, in promoting this. And so yesterday we said that when you want to remove darkness, you introduce light. When you want to remove ignorance, you introduce knowledge. The fire of suffering becomes the light of consciousness then. You can use suffering to bring in that awareness and that light which will remove that unhappiness and that negative suffering that uh, takes over our spirit. And so many, many things may matter in life, but only one thing matters the most. And that is finding out who you are. And your life has an inner purpose and an outer purpose. On the outside, there may be many things that may be your purpose. There are many things that you need to do to be successful. And that is fine. But these are all to do with doing things. But on the inside, your purpose is only one. And that is to awaken. To free yourself of this egoic structure that is an illusion of self. And to surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this awakening, this yaqda that is called by the urafa is your primary purpose. So if we were to define awakening, we would define awakening as follows. Awakening is a shift in consciousness 
where thinking separates from awareness. I'll say this again. Because we, when we are unconscious, we don't see the difference between being aware and the thinking mind. We completely identify that as one. Awakening is a state of consciousness in which awareness and thinking separate. And you can be aware without being uh, driven by thinking. And because Allah loves His creation and wants to drive them towards Himself, the initial process of awakening begins with Allah. It comes to us as a grace, as a lutf ilahi. It may come to you by a book that will come in your hands. It may come to you by a lecture you will listen to. You will not do any effort on your part, but Allah will drive you towards that. Thereafter, it is now up to you and me to take the next step. Many people will stop at that. Very nice book, very nice lecture, and then that's the end of it. To take it to the next level now is up to us. And Allah will give us several opportunities in life where He will give us these awareness opportunities to become aware, and then we need to take the next level. After that, once we have the facts in our hands and we know the importance of awakening, then the next level is sincerity. Which if you read books like Light Within Me, where Allama Taba Tabai and Shahid Mutahari and Imam Khomeini give the different ways in which one seeks enlightenment. They talk about irada and they talk about khulus and the importance of being sincere. Because the truth of the matter, my dear brothers and sisters, is you can't do anything to become enlightened. Allah brings enlightenment into you. What you do is you empty the heart. You, clean it, you cleanse it of attachments. You cleanse it of the idols in the heart. You remove the veils. Once you empty the heart and you make it ready, and you do that with sincerity, then it is Allah who places His own nur in that heart. That is why we are told knowledge is not what you read and write and what you hear and talk about. But knowledge is nur. Al-ilmu nur. It is nur that Allah puts in the heart of whomsoever He pleases. That is, whosoever is willing to uh, uh, empty his art for, for Allah. So when we talk about purifying the heart or cleansing the heart, what we're talking about is emptying it of all attachments, emptying it of all dependencies that seek happiness from outside rather than from inside. And then we have talked about this in past series of lectures, how then the one who seeks Allah will experience the love of Allah like flashes of lightning that fall on his heart. Up until this point, the love of Allah is coming to this person and it is unidirectional. It is coming one way only. And a lot of traditions that you will read about, whether it is Hinduism or Buddhism and so on, they stop at this level. They will talk about meditation, they will talk about contemplation, they will talk about awareness, they will talk about breaking the ego, but they will come to this point where you stop. Islam then takes it to the next level. It introduces the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now there is not only an input from Allah, but there is an output here that goes back towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it fulfills then that uh, hadith al-Qudsi of Allah that says, I was a hidden treasure and I wanted to be known. So I created a creation so that I may be known. And so what the dhikr of Allah does is it makes us a mirror. When we surrender, that tradition that says, I become the eyes with which he sees, and I become the ears with which he hears, and so on, we become a mirror when we are totally surrendered, in which Allah then is able to manifest his attributes and then reflect them back to himself. It is a profound idea, which if you understand it only with the mind and the ego, will come across as shirk. But that is not what we are uh, uh, trying to say. Because... At some point in your life, you will ask yourself, what is the purpose of life? I have done everything I had to do. I've gotten married, I've had children, I've got a job, I've bought a home, I've done this, I've done this, I've done... Now there's nothing to do. What is the purpose in life? Then you might say it is to help others. You might be a doctor, you might be a philanthropist, you might be a humanitarian, you might be anything. But is that really your purpose? Does Allah really need you for that? How base and how mean that for you to have a purpose in life, somebody else must suffer. Someone must sleep hungry so that you can give money in charity. Someone must be abused and oppressed so that you can have a purpose in life to fight oppression and to help the abused. That is not a noble goal in itself. It is noble, undoubtedly, and it is our duty. 
But your sense of purpose should not come so that somebody has to suffer for me to have a purpose in life. So dhikr of Allah gives us this purpose. Because now we are not the end, we are just a means, we are just a mirror. Allah wants to reflect His own attributes through us. And we now become a means only. And Allah has His purpose. And so when we understand the meaning of dhikr, when we understand the meaning of surrendering, when we understand of freeing ourselves from shaitan, we rise to a whole new mission. Our perspective changes on life, and we now uh, uh, understand uh, the real meaning for which we were created. But it is important that when we do the dhikr of Allah, we do it with consciousness and awareness. If we do it with the mind, because here is the thing, a mirror will not create a new image. A mirror will only reflect what falls upon it. So you have nothing to initiate. It starts with Allah. And therefore when you do dhikr in a state of the mind, it becomes a boring exercise. People will say it's a boring mindless exercise. Actually it's a boring mindful exercise. There's too much mind in there. And because it is starting from the mind, there is no feeling of Allah's love or connectedness. Because you are just a mirror. What can you start? But when you surrender and become a mirror, then you can reflect. And that surrender comes when you remain present and you remain Conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the first step is to become awakened, to become present, to be conscious, and then to do the dhikr of Allah. I'm coming towards a conclusion. And so I remind you once again, my dear brothers and sisters, that our task is not to connect with Allah. We are already connected. Our task is not to add something to our lives. Our task is to remove the veils and the illusions and the attachments that separate us from Him. And this truth, of course, is proven by the Qur'an. Does the Qur'an guide people? No. The Qur'an is a means. The truth is inside you. The Qur'an just removes the rust. And then you have the guidance within yourself. If you sprinkle water on a rose, it gives out a fragrance. If you sprinkle the same water on something that is rusty, it gives out a foul smell. Is it the water that is causing the rose to smell or the rust to smell? No. If you keep a piece of dry wood in the sun, it hardens. If you keep a piece of wax under the sun, it melts. Is it the sun that is melting it? No. It is treating both the same. It is the property of that recipient that is determining how it reacts to that. So the Qur'an, Allah says in the Qur'an, يَهْدِي بِهِ kathira, wa yudillu bihi kathira. Many are guided by it and many are misguided by it. وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهَا إِلَّا الْفَاسِقِينَ And none are misguided by it except the transgressors. So this same Qur'an which guides, this Qur'an also misguides. That means it is your heart which will guide you and misguide you. All you are doing by reading the Qur'an and interacting with it, or with Ahlul Bayt is pouring that water. So if you can think of that connection that we've been talking about, think of the connection from Allah as this nice shiny copper wire that's touching your side of the end, which is also a wire, but it's covered in rust. When you remove attachments, when you remove the veils, you are polishing that wire on your side and removing that rust. As soon as it is purified and there is a connection, there is a flow now. And through that flow, you will see love coming out. You will see the sparks of it coming out, which then manifests itself as the love of the Prophet, as the love of the Qur'an, as the love of the Ahlul Bayt. And that is where you see the Urafa and the Sufis expressing all that love of Allah. It comes when that connection is established, which is already there. And so what I want to say is that the underlying message in every mystical science, whether it's mysticism or Sufism or Irfan and so on, is this one idea to remove the layers and layers and layers of cultural and ritualistic baggage and superstitions and myths that we introduce and bring out the Tawheed which is beneath it. And this was the reason why Allah kept sending messengers after messengers after messengers because people kept adding layers and layers to that. And they started bringing Allah to their image, uh, imagination and they built idols and they began worshipping those idols and Allah kept getting sidetracked. And so this was the idea to remove layers and layers. What do we mean by dhikr of Allah? Dhikr of Allah does not mean that you sit in the mosque and say subhanallah, subhanallah, subhanallah. This is important and that's why I want to say this as I come to a conclusion. Dhikr of Allah is a state of being. It starts with the tongue. But there comes a point where the heart does a dhikr even when the tongue is silent. And so there is a state of being that I call a dhikri state of being in which a person is surrendered 
and then there is quality in all they do and that everything they do comes out of that dhikr you can still stand up against oppression you can still volunteer your time you can still serve the community you can still help others and give charity but you need to find ways to do that from a state of dhikr from a state of awareness so that you have this itminan that it is not to fulfill an egoic need it is not based on selfishness or greed but rather it is allah who is working through you and so many of us are already doing a lot of good work all we are asking to do is to raise the quality of what we are doing so that it comes from allah it comes from a state of dhikr rather than from a state of uh, uh, of the ego and so dhikr as well its purpose is to remove uh, layers and illusion and a lot of people ask me how do i concentrate in my salat you cannot stay all day in heedlessness driven by the mind and then come and pray four rakats and concentrate it will never work like that my dear brothers and sisters it is only when we learn to be with allah and with presence and with consciousness during the rest of the day that we will be able to focus in our salat so don't think of worship and dhikr as something that you need to focus on when you come to pray you will never succeed it has to be something that permeates our entire day our whole life and then we can uh, automatically experience that uh, that uh, concentration and that presence of allah and so at a higher level dhikr is that constant awareness of allah's presence or as that famous hadith that we shared and talked about on the night we had the question and answer dhikr true taqwa true allah consciousness and true state of being in dhikr is that allah should not find you where he does not want to see you and he should not miss you where he expects to see you and if you use this hadith as a guiding principle then you will find you are always in uh, the state of dhikr i want to end with an anecdote here there was an ayatullah who had reached a very high status of spirituality and he had reached such levels that there were psychic abilities manifesting through him the kind that we hear of you know people changing water into gold and uh, reading people's minds and traversing large areas or uh, you know land over a short period of time what is called payul ard and so on and so people came to him and asked him how did you attain this level of spirituality he said i attained this level with only one verse of the quran they were amazed one ayah of the quran can change a person he said yeah only one verse and a very short one too i brought it into my life and i practiced it day and night and it was my guiding principle which allowed me to raise to this level of spirituality they said what ayah of quran he said it is from suratul alaq iqra bismi rabbik alladhi khalaq verse 14 and what does the verse say alam ya'lam bi anna allah yara that's it does he not know that allah is seeing him that's it he said this verse changed my life it made me who i am alam ya'lam bi anna allah yara does he not know this human being that allah is watching him if this if we are convinced of this if this becomes our uh, day and life our motto so that everything we do from the time i wake up in the morning and i step outside the house from the time i meet someone who challenges me any suffering i encounter any temptation i inquire uh, that comes in my way if this is with me all the time alam ya'lam bi anna allah yara do you not know that allah is watching you it will guide you and keep you in this state of dhikr and that is why rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad that is why he said i'budu allah ka'annaka tarahu worship allah as if you see him fa in lam tarahu fa innahu yarak because if you cannot see him then most surely he is seeing you and that is why the ulama of akhlaq will say it is bad akhlaq to yawn while you are praying it is bad akhlaq to be scratching yourself and doing this and doing that you can't pretend all this when we are present and aware that is the true state of dhikr that allah is watching me at all times and so this is very important and this message that i have shared with you in these last 10 days that the root cause of all unhappiness and all suffering is being distracted from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeking happiness from outside and that the end of all forms of negative suffering 
is to be focused on Allah and to do his dhikr and to stay with presence and awareness in the now while constantly being in the remembrance of Allah and surrendering. This message, I can assure you, from today until the rest of your life, you will not find anyone who can give you any solution that will solve any form of negative suffering better than this. Whatever they tell you, it will either be synonymous with this or inferior to this. And the reason is not because I have said this, but because this is precisely what Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Ra'ad, which is chapter 13, verse 28. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَعِنُّوا قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Those who believe and their hearts find rest and tranquility with the remembrance of Allah. أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَعِنُّوا الْقُلُوبُ Let it be known that it is only by the remembrance of Allah that hearts will find rest and hearts will find peace and tranquility. And so with this we end our series tonight. والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa taala to accept our fasts in this month of Ramadan, and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa taala to help all those who strive in His path to remove all forms of negative suffering and all illusions and attachments that separate us from Him, so that we too may learn the true meaning of falling in love with Allah, and that our hearts as well may rest in peace and enjoy, insha Allah. في الدنيا والآخرة. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the appearance of our Imam and make us amongst his Ashab and Ansar. We pray to Allah for the maghfirah of our marhumin and for the shifa of those who are ill. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta sami'ul alim. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi. Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Talk about finding out who we think we really are. The first and the most fundamental question that a human being needs to ask uh, his or herself is, who am I? And Islam gives this a lot of importance. That is why time and time again you will hear people quoting this hadith from the member, Man arafa nafsa, faqad arafa rabba. Whosoever knows his self, he knows his Lord. In other words, to know Allah, you must first know yourself. And if we go by what we have said so far, if we describe the ego as nafs, then it fits perfectly. Man arafa nafsa, whosoever recognizes his ego, whosoever realizes what the ego is, then that is the avenue through which he will know Allah. Amma ba'd faqad qala Allahu tabaraka wa ta'ala fi kitabih. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Inna al-ladhina attaqaw idha masahum ta'ifum min ash-shaytan tadakkaru fa idha hum mubsirun. Salawat ala Muhammad. We continue with our discussion on the root cause of negative suffering and tonight inshallah we make a conclusion. Last night we stopped by saying that when one wishes to become aware of one's true identity, then there isn't anything to fight or suppress or remove, but rather one introduces awareness. Just like you don't fight darkness, you introduce light and it dissolves the darkness or you don't suppress and remove ignorance, you introduce knowledge and the ignorance dissolves. In the same way, we introduce awareness and that dissolves the heedlessness or the ghafla of being driven by the mind and believing every thought that comes into it. And we have been talking over these last several nights on how we bring about this awareness. We have talked about watching the mind, not identifying with the thinker, um, and we have also talked about being present at all times. We have also explained why and how, because shaitan helped in creating this egoic structure and keeping it alive, uh, the mind needs to constantly... <laughs> والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآله 
ثم الصلاة والسلام على آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المظلومين واللعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين constantly live in the past or the future to keep these thoughts coming through and so shaitan can only influence us when we allow ourselves to live in the past or the future when we live in the absolute present then shaitan does not have anything that he can work with he cannot generate thought that will give back unhappiness and suffering which the mind thinks is solving a problem but it is actually feeding uh, um, shaitan and then we said after this awareness, after this presence, the next step then is the dhikr of Allah. And we shall talk about that tonight. But before we do that, let us talk a little bit about a few things that we haven't had a chance to uh, do so until now. The first thing is, let us talk.